Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world right now. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Mormons International Edition. I am Daniel Yanez. And I'm Georgia Travers. How are you doing, Daniel? I'm doing very good, very well, thank you. I can see a little bit on your face for, uh, in, in the camera, like a little bit of light, still daylight. Is that, can you see it from yeah, the Yeah, just about. Yeah. We're hanging on to the daylight now. The days are getting longer. It's been really warm in the UK this week. It hit 15 degrees Celsius, which in Fahrenheit is what, late 50s, uh, early 60s? I guess, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been nice. Spring is coming. Easter's coming. I'm excited. And it was Shrove Tuesday this week, Pancake Day. So Yeah, Pancake Day. Do you want to tell us more about it, Georgia? I, the reason I ask is that I think for, for a few listeners, or maybe many listeners, this might be news. And uh, I was one of them when I moved to the UK. And maybe I should have known, but I didn't know much about it. Uh, what What is it? I had assumed that this was a worldwide thing, but clearly not. Maybe it's I mean, just it, in the UK that we celebrate it, Pancake it, it, Day. It is, it is, but maybe I'm a victim of of being a lifelong member of the church. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> the issue. Yeah. So Pancake Day, Shrove Tuesday, is when you use up all of your ingredients ahead of Lent. So typically this dates back kind of hundreds of years. You're using up your eggs, you're using up your fats and your flour, and you're making pancakes ahead of starting Lent, where you are encouraged to give up something for 40 days until Easter. So it's something that's celebrated in the UK to the point where we have aisles in our supermarkets that are full of ingredients for pancakes and pancake toppings. It's celebrated by, I assume, almost everyone in the UK. Did you yeah. have pancakes on Tuesday, Daniel? We actually, or youth activity, it was a combined young men and young women youth activity, and it was a pancake day activity. And the activity was we made pancakes. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> See, there and we the go. kids ate them and we just played played some games and uh, it, it was re really fun. And actually the, the supermarket aisles, you know, they were they had this dedicated area for pancake day supplies and that made my life really easy. I just went there and within two minutes I had everything I needed. So it's quite big and, and, and it's observed by, like it transcends the world of religion. It's like integrated in the culture here, I guess. Uh, which is actually really nice, especially in a very secularized country. There are still some elements that secular people still do that have a root in Christianity, and that, that I think is quite nice. Um, yeah, this is a Christian holiday, essentially, and it's something that we celebrate here in the UK quite a lot. Yeah. We've got a bit of a French influence, though, because they're not American pancakes. They tend to be the flat pancakes that mm, you find like in crepes. France. Yeah, the, more like crepes, and we put sort of sugar and lemon is my favorite topping for them. Yeah, sugar so. and lemon. That that was also new to me when I moved to the UK. Um, Rather than just the syrups or the, the yeah, chocolate well, sauce. That you in, usually in, put in Chile, them. in Chile, we make pancakes, which sounds just like pancakes. Uh, usually, you eat them with manjar, which is like dulce de leche, like this caramel thing that is very traditional in South America, uh, or with marmalade, jam, or something like that. So it, it is quite common. But yeah, like the, the toppings of lemon and cake, or in the US, like the, the, the thicker ones with cream and with all that stuff, all that is a bit more foreign to me. But I, I enjoy that that tradition. Uh, I think it's it's good that that we uh, what we're increasingly, and we, we have some articles actually this week that, that refer to it, we're increasingly as a church becoming aware of some of these traditions. And, and I said before that I'm probably the victim of being a lifelong member of the church and not knowing about these things because of it like because in our tradition we have not historically engaged in these longer easter traditions and holidays chile is a very catholic country you know uh, quaresma which is lent it is big in the in the catholic world and they have ash wednesday as well which is right after shrove tuesday but we just don't really engage as a church with that actually growing up there was a bit of a more of a reticence to kind of be, be associated with many of those symbols and, and we still carry some of that with more of a reticence with being associated with the cross the roman cross as a, as a symbol of christianity right so and i think by by doing that of course there's an opportunity cost of of just not knowing about those things and and i, I don't know what, what do you think with, with your experience coming into the church nearly 10 years ago now uh and probably having grown up with this tradition and, and finding that in our church we don't kind of formally do it how did that feel like what, what are your thoughts on, on our kind of intersection as latter-day saints and, and these traditions 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, we celebrate Easter. We celebrate Easter and Christmas as Latter-day Saints, which is wonderful. I think it's a shame that we don't celebrate Easter in its full capacity. You know, Shrove Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, then we've got Good Friday even. I think maybe the reason that we don't is because I've I've seen in various literature that we don't like to focus on the death of Christ. We like to focus on his resurrection, which is why, you know, the the symbol of our church is the living Christ as opposed to focusing on the on the crucifixion and the cross. But I think we can uh, marry the two up quite nicely. And I think we could do more. I specifically saw that under Easter um, on the whether it's the Bible dictionary or the gospel topics Mm. or whatever it is, I get all of those mixed up in, in my brain. It actually has a, has a sentence that says we do not celebrate Holy week. And Mm. that was quite shocking to me. I I wondered why we don't. Um, But then again, I think there's a bit of a contradiction because in the last couple of years, I feel like more of an emphasis has been placed on celebrating Easter. Certainly we've received the news this year that we're just to have a sacrament meeting and then, not to have the second hour meetings on yeah. Easter Sunday. And correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like that's... Oh, that's right, yeah. We're basically codifying a different experience for those specific Sundays uh, by removing that second hour. It's, it's interesting. I, I've seen some comments about shouldn't we spend more time at church those Sundays since you know it has a bigger significance. But in any case, we're signaling that those dates are special, right? that we're formally either celebrating them or recognizing them as, as different than the other Sundays. And I think that that is a positive. Uh, I think it's but... a positive. I am confused in that one day that we celebrate quite a lot at church, and maybe it's just in our congregation. I'm not sure. Maybe it's in all congregations. We mm. seem to really focus on Mother's Day a lot, mm. almost more than Easter. I don't know if I'm hitting on a top G subject, but just someone who's fairly new to all of this, you know, well, I'm 10 years in, but hmm. it just seems like we make a really big deal out of mothers and, and not necessarily about Easter, but hmm, it, I, 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 think, it is. I, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. And and I, I don't know, I, I can hon- only hypothesize and speculate as, uh, as to the reasons because I'm not a church historian, but f- from my experience, I have seen that. And I think it's been out of mainly, you know, recognizing something as important as motherhood, which you know, in, in in our church culture and doctrine has been something very big, you know, families, eternal families and all of that. Um, and uh, probably being a little bit myopic on w- what signal that sends when when we don't ap- kind of attribute at least an equal, equal way to other dates. And, and I think on not celebrating Easter, all of that, like, uh, I honestly believe, at least this is a Chilean version that I grew up with in the 90s and early 2000s, is a lot of it was was just to distinguish ourselves from the rest of Christianity, which, by the way, back then was much more prevalent than now, where most of the the intent is generally to work alongside other Christian faiths and to to be a little bit more intertwined. And Mm -hmm. some of the news that we have to discuss today show that. But back then there was much more like, oh, Catholics do that. We don't. We do this other way because we are the true church. And and one of those things I think was Easter. I I don't know if I've shared this experience in train. Maybe I did with Danny in one of the earlier episodes last year. But I got married on Good Friday. Right? So Good Friday was the day that we picked. It happened to be April 6th, by the way. So another significant date for, for ch- church history. Uh, one of the reasons we got married then is was because it was the only day that we found availability in hotels to do it, and the, the hotel that where we did it was like, yeah, we, we have the day you want to do it then. And I remember when we were planning and discussing the details with the hotel staff that, that were organizing everything, they were a bit surprised that we wanted to eat uh, meat, you know, uh, beef for our dinner, because a tradition in Catholicism is that during Holy Week, especially on, on Good Friday, you don't eat meat. So they were just proposing fish meals and things like that. And we were like, no, we eat meat. And I remember feeling a little bit like, oh, that, that's so silly. Of course, we're going to eat meat. And now in hindsight, I'm like, if they were really devoted Catholics, they probably thought we were heretics or or, mm-hmm. or something like that. And and all of those traditions, I think a lot of them, the, the answers that I've heard informally, and some of those are hinted at more formally in, in by, by general church leaders in the past and whatnot is that many of those things don't have a biblical basis you know that there's not like instruction about this holy week many of these events have been traditionally kind of structured around these 40 days and many of the events of holy week are not necessarily tied to like specific time frame in the bible 
yet we do celebrate Christmas and there's no substance to, to, to that either. So in a way we have this little bit of a double standard in which we've arrived to this point, I think without much planning, it just happened organically. And, but I, I'm enjoying this reckoning of, you know what, actually we should place a much bigger emphasis on Easter and probably the emphasize some of the other things and uh, there was a really good podcast episode this week and we, we will put the article the the article pointing to it uh it's from mormon land from the Salt Lake tribune our uh, eric huntsman the currently um he, he was this uh byu Salt Lake center kind of a dean or, or head i don't remember his title and he's currently on leave because the jerusalem center was closed during the, the current ongoing conflict but he he talks about this uh, in in really good detail and kind of the benefit that we as Latter day Saints can get from a, a closer association with um, Easter traditions. And it's really good, highly, highly recommended to listen to it and just to in introspectively consider should we do more of this at a personal level, maybe in our wards, in our stakes, with the wider community, because the wider community is doing things. Like there's a great opportunity to go out and take part on, on, on all of that. And I'll stop my monologue there. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I think <laughs> no, it's a great. It's interesting topic. to listen to. And I wonder if there's more that we could do in our local congregations to celebrate local holidays. One that I've always been really curious about, and we will move on in a minute, but I don't know anything about it. I don't even know the name of it in Spanish, but it's the yeah. day of the the day of the dead. Is that day of the dead? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm so curious about that one because obviously we've got you know we're big into looking into our ancestors and into family history and all yeah. that kind of thing. And that, from what I know about it, which is uh, the film Coco, yeah. which is on <laughs> Disney Plus. That's all I know about it, which is yeah. a really, really you know layman's understanding of it. But that seems like a really good holiday for Last Day Saints to celebrate. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, 100%. I don't know much of the details either. Guess what? It's because I grew up in the church. <laughs> uh, <laughs> even though I am from South America, where this is bigger, this is much bigger in Mexico. So, you know, Central and Northern, Northern America. And Mexico itself has a like, very culturally intertwined, uh, you know, uh, tradition with Dia de los Muertos, with Day of the Dead. Uh, but but I, I think you're right. Uh, the day before that is uh, called uh, All Saints Day, the 1st of November, which also has a component that, that comes from there. And well, it's actually tied to Halloween in a way, because you know, it's right after the 31st of, of, of... Yeah, Halloween is All Hallows' Eve, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So I don't want to uh, share any false information. I, I, all I know is that they're intertwined, interconnected. My understanding, is it's also kind of associated with the Catholic tradition. And probably we don't take part in it as much because of that, because of kind of our historical attempt to be peculiar and not associated with that. And now we're yeah. in this process in, in, in churches, in, in, in current church history of actually reassessing some of those stances. And and I'm I'm here for it. I'm I'm learning a lot uh, from those things. Uh, and 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 I think that that'd be great if if we can. Um, be inclusive of those traditions. Certainly, uh, I don't know if they do anything about it in the church in Mexico for the other los muertos, like church. Yeah, potentially just a, no a more local, a local effort for a local, yeah. more local holiday might be. Yeah, and might uh, be more appropriate. if we if we have any listeners from Mexico or that know, yeah, write, write in, and let us know. We'd love to to learn about that here in the UK. Uh, I, I always found it very peculiar. The, uh, another Sunday that had kind of that emphasis, just like you mentioned Mother's Day, uh, and that uh, I, I found surprising, quite nice, but at the same time, it uh, made me ask myself, like, are we kind of overdoing it or not? Which is Remembrance Sunday. Remembrance mm -hmm. Sunday in November here, where the, it's the commemoration of the armistice after World War One. Uh, it's a huge deal here in the UK. It's very, very big, right? Yeah. And in church... It is. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, everyone wears a poppy to celebrate. You know, the start yes. of November marks the start of remembrance. It's the 11th of the 11th. We remember it. it I used to work at a military school and it was a huge deal. <laughs> All the students would march. They'd play the bagpipes. You know, um, a lot of people in our congregation actually choose to go to other Christian churches on Remembrance Sunday because they prefer how how they do it oh, there they do. or they'll go to a, they'll go to a local parade or or something like that you're right that is a, a huge part yeah. of our, our culture and our tradition yeah and even with, within the church there there's been well i, I was here for the 100th 
a commemoration of the armistice in 2018. And that one was an even bigger deal, you know, being the, the centen centennial of it. And there was a special program on sacrament meeting and things like that. And but, but every Sunday that I've been here as well, we do take time during sacrament meeting, since we're from 10 to 11. Uh, as we approach 11, we do take a minute of silence by 11. So we usually finish a bit earlier. We have a poem reading or something that, like that. And after that, we finish. Some Sundays we have finished singing uh, the national anthem, you know, God Save the Queen or King now. And um, all of that has a lot of layers to it. And uh, we're in a multicultural church, especially here in the UK, or the makeup of our congregation is for, from many, many different backgrounds. And um, while I don't mind it at all, like personally, I I find it a kind of a recognition of a local tradition that that while it's not directly related to the gospel, it has to, we can make connections that are quite quite helpful. But I also know that for many others, it can be a really rough thing to reckon with a church, you know, with with a history of colonialism and things like that, uh, and, and even singing the national anthem, which is a separate topic about the the future hymn book, but. Um, you know, it's a super fascinating topic to discuss. In my current calling, it's, it's been, uh, you know, I've asked that question myself a, a few times, like, how can we nail this? And, and it's really difficult. I know that for some members, it's hard. And others truly expect it. And not doing something would be super, super hard. So it's a catch-22 a little bit. Uh, same in Chile for Independence, Independence Day, where the, um, the national anthem is sung, even though it's not a, it's not in the hymn, hymn book. So there are kind of diverging views on whether we should do it or not plus or history is what's quite charged with the national anthem you know associated with the history of for for um dictatorship back in the 70s and 80s and so it, it's it's touchy um but it's also fascinating listeners if you have any traditions from your different um uh, you know geographical areas that you want to share please send them we over this is the hear. right episode yeah we, we really really want to know what it's done, how it's felt, and what we could do better and uh, yeah. learn from. So send your feedback to contact at thisweekinmormons.com. We would love to hear from you. That is true. And maybe before jumping into the, the news, we should also thank those that make this possible. We forgot to do it at the beginning. So we're here thanks to Poston, our sponsor. Uh, we're delighted to have them uh, sponsoring our, uh, This Week in Mormons. Uh, for those that have access to it, mainly in the US, we invite you to consider it. It's a great alternative to beverages that under our theology, we don't drink, right? But but this this is good. This is helpful and uh, posthum. Thank you very much for sponsoring that. And also this is made possible by Patreon listeners. So on, on Patreon later on, we will be talking about some other topics. Uh, we invite you to consider it. It's gonna be another really interesting conversation around an article on church attendance. Uh, there's this article from Religion, Religion News Service that is called How Many Mormons Are Actually in Church Every Week in the U.S.? And just to give you a teaser, uh, cell phone data is used to, to kind of quantify this. So it's like an alternative way from uh, other estimates or, or the, the official reports. And that's going to be interesting. We're going to be talking about uh, what that means for war boundaries, right-sizing wards and stakes, the implications of our approach towards that. You know, we're quite peculiar in having this geographical kind of dogma of who goes where and who's your bishop. And if you step up outside of that, you, you know, it doesn't count. So and, 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 uh, we want you to join that conversation. So consider subscribing uh, to Patreon to listen to that discussion later on with Georgia. Do you want to add anything to that, Georgia? I mean, it's it's just a dollar a month or £1.20 a month or however much in, in your or local currency, more. wherever you happen to be listening. Yeah it's, yeah, it's not a lot, and it's well worth subscribing so you can support the podcast if you enjoy listening. Yes, indeed. So let's jump right to the news. You want to lead us with the first one? Yeah, it's from my favorite apostle, <gasps> Elder Kieran. <laughs> wow. So I know, Elder Kieran this week uh, was interviewed by Deseret News, and he was asked why he doesn't use his middle initials, and he said words to the effect of, it's just not what I do as a British person. So yeah. I found out that he actually does have, um, well, he has two He has two middle names. Yeah, what not was Just it? one, but yeah. two. I think it was Robert and something else. Yeah. And he made a conscious choice about 15 years ago when they asked him for his, his name and his initials to say, I don't want to go by my initial. I am Elder Patrick Kieran. And I... I didn't think it was possible for me to love the man any more than I already did. And then he found a way. 
Yeah, well, for for new listeners, if you haven't listened to some of our previous episodes, Georgia has a particular pet peeve about the middle. So do initial... you. So do you. Not just I me. Know, both I of know. us here. Both of us here. <laughs> Get on board. I, I I know it's a yeah, it's a pet peeve that I have as well. It's one that I develop over time, though. At the beginning, I did I didn't mind. I'm pretty sure, you know, earlier on, I wouldn't have minded being referred to as Daniel A. Yanez. Uh, but but over time, I've been like, why do we do that? It just sound odd. And th there was a For really me, interesting... the only reason would be if we had to say we have a Tom Smith and we, we have two of them and we need to mm -hmm. differentiate between the two, then we might use the middle initial. But otherwise, I just don't get it. You know, these names are not, you know, common names if we've got... Yeah. I can understand M. Russell Ballard, you know, because he goes by his middle name or D. Todd yeah. Christopherson because he goes by Todd. But for someone like David A. Bednar, how many apostles are there called David A. Bednar? Yeah. One. So we we just don't need the A. How to distinguish. It's, it's, yeah. It's how I feel. Anyway, so Elder Kieran, he yeah, feels the same great. way as we do. I think it's just a really British thing that we just don't do it ever. Yeah. And may, maybe another British thing, or maybe maybe this this sounds right, but maybe it's also a British thing to just, you know, saying it like it is. <laughs> saying, you know what, I'm not doing that. That's fine. And I feel empowered and I won't do it. Uh, I read in the article that it's the first apostle in over 110 years or so that deliberately does that. The first one since Roger Clausen or, or Carson. I don't remember exactly. So um, since then, always the convention was to add the middle name. Um, some of them, as you said, uh, had an explanation and a, and a function to it, like Joseph Fielding Smith versus Joseph F. Smith, even though the F also yes. stands for Fielding. Uh, things like that do have a function or the preference to be referred to by the middle name or not, like M. Russell Ballard. He, he was Melvin Russell Ballard, just like his grandfather, Melvin Ballard. All, all that I understand. Another peculiarity is that when we sustain, I don't know if it's in every conference, but when we sustain... Uh, the first presidency, the quorum of the twelve in general conference. They, they usually read the full name, so Russell Marion Nelson, yes, and Dieter Frederick Ludorf or something like that. You know, they, they do say which the I understand full name. because if we're fine. if we're sustaining them, maybe they want to use their proper title, which is which yeah. is totally fine by me. Yeah, yeah, it's fine as well. That's that's not part of the scope of this uh, pet peeve, but yeah, we are big fans of Elder Kieran, even though we haven't heard it yet as a as an apostle from General Conference, and we haven't had a chance to raise our hand. But uh, I think this this sets an interesting precedent that I think if we extrapolate to other church traditions and naming conventions, or or even if we take a bit further as to how we name things at church, one one thing that this made me think about is some of the experiences that I've had as a uh, somebody with a name from the Spanish speaking world, from the Spanish tradition, which our surnames are dual. We, we carry both our, uh, our father's surname as the first surname, but also part of our legal name is our mother's maiden name or mother's yes. surname. I was going to say, because typically you have longer names and yeah. that's why then, because you take part of the mother's name and part of the father's name. So typically you have two surnames, is that correct? Yeah, I have two surnames. My, my, my actual legal name, if you look at my password, is Daniel Yanez Fernandez. So those two surnames. Now, it, it, it can it's really helpful for family history, by the way, because you have a provenance, you know, that you, you always have the, the, the origin of, you know, the parents included in the name of anybody. Uh, you, you don't lose that, that uh, female name. Also, it's more inclusive as well in preserving the, 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 the surname of, of the women, the, the women yes. line for, for longer. Um, so it has these advantages. One of the disadvantages is when you step into the English speaking world or other areas where surnames are usually just one field when you fill things out online or, you know, in the NHS here in the National Health Service, when I moved in, they captured just my mother's surname because it was the last word in the string of, you know, names and surnames. So I'm Daniel Fernandez to them. So every time I go to the GP for an appointment, it's like Mr. Fernandez. And I'm like, okay, that's not me, but that's me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'll go there. Mm -hmm. So how does that tie to church? Uh, you know, one use case is uh, when we have work conference or state conference, you know, how they print out um, uh, a list from, from the system, you know, back in the day, I guess it was manual, but now you can, if you are a work clerk preparing for work conference, you just click on create the report for sustainings. And that includes the first presidency, blah, 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 all the way down to world leaders. And so every time that's generated always comes out with errors or with issues. 
uh, because of that. For you, and, because of your name. Yeah, for, for, yeah, exactly. So I have to correct, like, can you add Fernandez or can you remove, can you ensure that you don't remove Yanez and you can actually add it because this, this is the most important part of it. By short, I usually go by Daniel Yanez, right? Even though Fernandez is part of it. Uh, it has another piece to it, which is that in, in the Spanish speaking world, at least in Chile, or at least in my family, I got married and my wife, uh, you know, you, the women don't change their surnames legally. You know, they, they preserve their, their name. So, and usually it's up to them to, to, to decide whether they will be, have a preferred surname of the husband or not. Um, but, but most keep it. So my wife has a different surname. Uh, and that's problematic because when the, you run that church report for sustaining, it adds my name. You know, it like the, the church made the decision that her surname is mine. You know, it kind of mm -hmm. has that English speaking convention. And it's like in a global church where we have all of these variation of, of naming conventions. It's, it is it is really tricky, right? We probably need to, to consider those things. And at the moment where we are with my wife is that when that happens, we always need to be mindful and email the stake presidency or the bishop saying, oh, FYI, you know, her name is this, please read it that way. Even I made the mistake from saying her name from the pulpit with my surname <laughs> and I felt terrible. And she called it out and I was like, I can't believe I did that. Yeah. But, but yeah. Just so you know, naming things is important and we can do a little bit better job at it. And I don't know why I went on that tangent, but um, it, thank you It all links back to Elder Kieran choosing his own name. And I think the other thing which is significant about this is he is someone who is willing to break the tradition and break the norm. And I'm excited for the other traditions and norms that Elder Kieran might yeah. break moving yeah. forwards. I can't even begin to imagine what kind of things he might do, but I hope he's someone who is pushing boundaries and bringing a fresh perspective yeah. to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles because I really do think that's needed. And I'm just so, I'm really yeah. excited to hear from him in conference and, and to find out what he has to say. Likewise, looking forward to seeing the, the, those um, gradual cultural evolutions. And I remember 10, 15 years ago when I started seeing President Ugdorf then, Elder Ugdorf now, being in, in public settings or pictures without a tie you know that, that was mm -hmm. not really seen like it was part of the standard that if they were photographing public or something like that they would all, almost always be kind of white shirt and tie and he was just posting stuff on social media with just a shirt and things like that and being much more natural about that and that has already kind of pushed some boundaries it's much more normal to see some of the other apostles especially the newer ones with that so this is this, this has a commonality with that and uh, over time who knows when are we going to see the blue shirts or the facial hair or or, or some other things? As we're already seeing, right, a much more acceptance of, of dress uh, standards for women where they just wear slacks or, or trousers to, to ch or pants, as I say in the U.S., to church, right, um, which was controversial 10 plus years ago. And now it's it's not, at least in our ward, in our, in our state, it's like, you know, I, I don't think it is. Maybe you correct me if, if I'm wrong. But things like that, that gradually evolve, uh, I'm, I'm all, all for it. And yeah, hear I, had about a, it I, have, I was very close to an argument with someone in our ward the other week because she said that the the younger sisters in our ward had, had lost, what was it, like lost their something or other because they're now wearing trousers to church. Oh, really? And I just, <laughs> I just said to her, just get over it. Like, you know, it's... Well, it's not the gospel. We can wear what we want. That's just my view. We should be mm. able to wear whatever we want. I love it when we get, we've got members in our congregation from Ghana and from Nigeria and from other places, and they wear these beautiful colored shirts to church. And that's appropriate dress. That's formal dress in their culture. And I see absolutely no issue with that. I think they look wonderful when they choose to do that. So I think if we want to wear trousers, if we want to show our respect, um, for the ordinance of the sacrament by wearing formal dress. And if that includes trousers for women, fine by me. Mm -hmm. and by yeah. Me. So yeah, I got a bit um, heated with this usually lovely lady, but. Um, yeah. Well, it happens. I've had similar encounters regarding facial hair and beards, as you know, or full bishopric in our ward is bearded or some, mm -hmm. some degree of facial hair or other unconventional standards to what used to be common with priesthood leaders and, um, but it's but been Daniel, good. didn't Jesus have a beard? <laughs> as far is... as we know, as far as they paint him, yeah. This this is it. What's what's wrong with the facial hair? You know, 
he's he's the most most perfect person ever and mm. he may or may not have had facial hair but yeah and all I the way think, you know, even within our church all the way up to george albert smith you know in the you know late 1940s early 1950s also facial hair so it's, it's a cultural thing and, and i think uh you're right that's what I'm yeah i mean if <laughs> someone wants to change my mind on this please do and please yeah. add you know a depth to my understanding that i don't yeah. currently have but i just don't get it probably the, the one like thing i would said, say our, our bishop rick are, are fully bearded and i'm here for yeah. it and even long hair in one case and, and mm -hmm. i'm all for it as well i do want to yeah yeah i do want to um add one last thing on, on that before moving on to the next one which is i do want to extend a, uh, a little bit of uh grace to the older generation members and kind of how conflicted sometimes they might be with some of these changes and the reason is that uh i'm old enough to remember that back in the day that drum was really beat you know this is the way we look this is the way this is what good looks like and in a way you know if if you have facial hair if you do these things it's a signal of it's tied to your worthiness you know so I, i'm old enough to have heard those things so i i get it now why some of them when they start seeing these things they're quite conflicting and they have this cognitive dissonance and by and large, I've seen that most of them, when they come to this realization that, you know what? Yeah, it didn't quite make sense back then. We'll move on and they accept it. And I'm really, really encouraged by that. Uh, but sometimes there are some that struggle a bit more with that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I suppose I'm someone who's not been there for that and I don't get that. And I'm just someone with fresh eyes yeah. coming in. So I apologize if Which I love. I've offended anyone. No, I, I never hope to do that. No, no, I think if anything, we need those fresher pairs of eyes that can see through the, sorry to say this, put it this way, but through the nonsense of those things. So thank you for your voice on that. Uh, okay, the next one. Uh, there was a notification that came to my inbox this week, and now it's public knowledge, which is there's a special issue of the March for the Strength of Youth magazine and also a for the strength of youth pocket guide that will come with it so this is an official church letter that came to all uh bishoprics and and youth leaders and all of that that there's going to be a special edition that's really cool uh, th there's precedent to this with the liahona or end signing back in the day with special editions that they would announce and try to add some actions to it uh, in this case, I think some of the actions that they requested local leaders to engage in is to visit or meet uh, personally with the youth to give it to them and to, to give this uh, uh, copy of the For the Strength of Youth pocket guide, which uh, I think is a bit of a nudge for local leaders to have that one-to-one -one time with youth and their families. And it's, it's yeah, good to see Yeah, I think it's good. Team. I mean, Elder Uchtdorf gave a talking conference called Jesus Jesus Christ is the Strength of Youth, didn't he? And I think yeah. there's there's a bit of a focus on that in the letter from having having scanned through it and there's a new for strength of youth pamphlet which has been around for a little while now i still haven't delved too much in it but i think it's largely principle based rather than a set of rules and i yeah. think that's much needed for the youth of today that they can have the principles and they can govern themselves rather than being told the do's and don'ts of, yeah. of what to do and i i shared this uh, information actually a couple of months ago on my social media with my with my friends who aren't members because i had a few people i did a, a faith question and answer thing on my hmm. on my social media i had loads right. and loads of people asking me questions because 90 percent of the people that i associate with are not members of of our church and that's so cool yeah it was it was great to get to get their feedback on how they see how they perceive my experience of church and what a lot of them were saying is um how do you go with the rules you know there are so many rules and i said well actually there's a there's a new youth booklet which is now no longer prescribing a standard for for dress for piercings for tattoos that kind of thing and it, it's saying you know seek your own inspiration on these things and and arrive at your own conclusions rather than being told what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And I just think this we're in a, a really saturated information age. And I think if the youth are told what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing, I feel like they're going to rebel because there's just so many points of view out there. There's so much information that they're exposed to so much more than they were exposed to 10, 20, 30 years ago with the, the rise of social media and the rise of the internet. So I think it's it's good. And I don't know the contents of this edition of the magazine but hopefully it'll be emphasizing that message again hopefully yeah i've been thinking a lot about the youth because of my current calling i, I engage with them 
a lot. And even without it, I, I have uh, children that are in, both of them in, in, in the youth program now, uh, with one of them starting this year. And it, it's just such a different generation to us, even though I don't consider myself like super old, but I was going through their, their experiences 20 years ago, 20 plus. And things that just have changed, and, and they have changed. Like what they live through, what they go through, makes them have a completely different expectation of things and relationship. And and to their credit, their moral compass. I, I think we we sometimes don't give them enough credit that newer generations are coming with a sense of equity and um, fairness uh, at the individual, at, at the social level. That is much more attuned to 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 the needs of others, yes. right? That that I think is great. And the problem with that a little bit is that that has forced us to examine ourselves as, as youth leaders, as as wards, as as a church, to see like, are we doing this right? Like, is is the message, the way we're sharing the message of the restoration of the gospel, really resonating with them, or are are they finding those those things that their moral compass is leading them towards? outside the church, you know? And, and I found myself thinking that, for example, one thing that I really uh, struggled with a little bit, even though I do get behind, fr behind from the theory, but I'm still struggling on how to communicate it, is uh, full-time missions. Uh, I had an incredible experience as a full-time missionary uh, to the point that I would recommend it to absolutely everybody. And I did internalize it as a as a duty that I had, since in, in the church it's, it's preached that way, right? It's, it's a duty of those at whole. The priesthood, and, and and I was really looking forward to it. So uh, you know, I have uh, lived testimony of uh, how fascinating and how important that experience is. However, uh, I'm from the generation where that drum of this is a duty and you have to do it uh, was bit quite often, and it, it worked with many. I'm also quite aware many of my peers, you know, they went because of that and they had a bad experience. You know, they were probably not at the right time, or they just you know, it, it was not for them at, at that time, and they ended up having a detrimental experience as a result. And and what I hear from kind of local or area leaders or general leaders, sometimes I find it conflicting. In that, I think there's much more of an openness now to 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 get uh, the youth to consider missions for the right reasons, right? Yet, oftentimes, also this message, like it is a duty, and kind of we have already made the decision for you. Like we heard from Elder Pearson, I believe, who precise the Utah area or did, but when I heard that from him, or or even some of the tones of kind of or area presidency, even though I, I found their message much more nuanced, or even from the, the, the twelve. While it's while it's true, like I'm not negating the doctrine, like I really do wonder how can we best convey this in a way that will not actually create antibodies on mm -hmm. the youth saying, like, look, I want to do it because I want to do it. Like if you're telling me it's a duty. Cool, say it, but it's not helping, right? That, that, that's the way I perceive it, and and I don't have the answer. I, I've been seeking for that answer now in my current calling, and and we're integrating much more things to 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 involve uh, conversations about full time and service missions with them. But this is just uh, a bit difficult. So I hope that this issue of the strength of youth magazine uh, that we strike the right tone. Like I'm really looking forward to seeing what's there because it can really help me <laughs> in in what I do as a parent and all of that. So. I am excited. Yeah, me too. And I I think the points that you've made are are very, very valid. And I think we're just in such a different generation, even in the last 10 years from a generation that we've been in before. You know, the needs and the the difficulties are different from what they've ever been before. And I mean, I'm a classroom teacher. I'm a physics teacher in a secondary school. And this week has just been wild to the point where all of the head teachers of all of the schools in our local area have had to club together and have had to send a letter out to parents and carers about an issue that Daniel you and I never faced because it wasn't even invented and that is vaping so oh. it's it's such a huge issue in our area at the moment because people are getting themselves into really bad situations uh, where they don't know what they're doing and experimenting in things that they don't know uh, how much harm they're doing to their yeah. you know young bodies and it's become such an issue that the head teachers have felt to contact the parents about it. And I saw that a big letter had been sent out from all the head teachers in the local area. And before I opened the letter, I just paused and I said, OK, if I was a head teacher, what would I be sending a letter about? The first thing that came to my mind 
what's the vaping issue that we've got mm. in this area? And then I opened the letter and sure enough, that's what it was. I knew what it was ahead of time wow. because it's just, it's it's such an issue and it's something with, that we simply never faced. So I think the youth are um, in such a unique position now in, in 2024, a position that even 15 years ago, we couldn't have anticipated. So I think all of this, um, all of these issues and all of the, questions that we have and the way that things are it's just a, a sign of the times that we're living in and hopefully you know jesus christ is the strength of youth going back to that message yeah. hopefully we can find relief in the savior and hopefully that magazine article will be will be useful yeah. and those conversations will be useful yeah and, and it's not one that when thinking about the youth and the future of the church it's not not, not an easy challenge I, I think just looking at the current kind of demographic kind of uh, distribution of age groups um even if we kept all of the youth uh that are currently attend church active for the next 10 15 20 years it's going to be a smaller church at least here in europe right mm -hmm. families are having less kids or uh, and and it's just just difficult like i'm anticipating for that like preparing mentally for that reality within 10 15 20 years where i i think that's going to be the trend even if we preserve all all of them and, and yeah the challenges that they are facing are very unique and uh i i pray i honestly pray that the you know all of these actions that were getting kind of centrally shared with us from the church will be helpful um and i give the benefit of the doubt to all of those involved i was really encouraged by the young women's um uh, advisory board that was set up a few months ago not as much with the young men's board we talked about it in our last episode where i think the younger youngest one on the board was 50 something right so that disconnect you know uh it's something that i'm a bit like oh let, let, let's see if it works out but i'm optimistic i'm optimistic and we'll, we'll see when it comes uh and, and I, I also think I'm going to get it at home. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the harder the challenge, the stronger you are when you come through it. And yeah. these youth are are special and they're be, they've been given these unique challenges because of the strength of their characters. We need to trust them more. Yeah. As I said before, they have a strong moral compass and those uh, that have uh, that engage at church, I, I hope they're having spiritual experiences where that moral compass is not just that, it's, you know, actually a spiritual compass and start mm. building faith and, and all of that. Absolutely. But thank you for, for that commentary. Uh, should we move on to the next one? Yeah, so this is something that's quite close to your heart, Daniel. Um, so yes. why don't you talk us through it? Yeah, so uh, this is a statement from the South America South Area Presidency that was published in the Worldwide uh, Newsroom. And it's uh, the, the Church of Jesus Christ joins relief efforts in wake of fatal Chile forest fires. Um, and yeah, they offer a statement of, of solidarity. This hits home for obvious reasons. I am from Chile and even further so some of my family was affected by these fires. For context, especially for American listeners, um, the fires that happened in Chile ravaged many, many uh, cities within the Valparaiso region, very, very close to Santiago, but in the coast. And it was of a similar devastation of, uh, than that of the recent California fires a couple of years ago. And also the more recent Ma Maui, Hawaii fires is one, one of those where there were like a flash fire that started from like a wildfire from from you know non uh, populated areas and they just got to this very hilly area that, that you know wiped out entire neighborhoods entire cities um the, the, the geography of that region is very similar to southern california very similar to la to to santa barbara all, all of that so with the difference that is a much more modest <laughs> Uh, area there's a lot of really cramped uh, kind of uh, low income housing that uh, many people are not insured as well so losing all of that is, is losing everything uh, hundreds of people died i think the latest count was about, around 140. Uh, the this church statement acknowledges that about 100 uh, church members were affected and, and lost their homes I checked with some friends and no chapels were affected, fortunately, and the church is really active now in providing aid uh, and, and support to those that were left homeless. He hits further home because my uncle actually lost his house. He was amongst the affected. He lived in the second hardest hit um, uh, town in, in this whole uh, disaster. 
and uh, it's been really rough. I've been lucky enough in my life that I've never been affected this close by something of this nature. And my uncle, he's near almost 70 years old. He's a retired postman that, you know, worked his whole life to build this. He's a widow as well. Um, so all of his memories with his wife were tied to this house and it, it's all gone. So it, it is heartbreaking. Um, luckily, uh, it's the first time I do a, a fundraising campaign to support. And I, I guess I was privileged in my position of living outside of Chile to reach out to a very wide network of friends and acquaintances and all of them pitched in and we were able to raise uh, some, a decent amount of money for my uncle. But I do wonder what about the others that don't have that nephew living abroad that kind of can can do that uh so yeah it's been really rough it's been really great to see the church involved in this i don't know if you saw at the bottom of the article georgia that the church is uh, working alongside the red cross and also an adventist church organization locally to engage yeah in the interfaith effort. connection there which is nice yeah so well we, we send all of our prayers thoughts and also our aid through the church to uh the chilean science of which i am one of them especially when it hits the area that, that where I was born, where I was raised. It was my, my, my town was affected, you know, where, where, I, was, yeah. where I was born. And um, one last comment on that. It seems like when a Chile temple is announced, there is a disaster that follows. When the Concepcion Temple was announced in southern Chile, where I served my mission in 2009, three months later, we had this massive earthquake, still in the top 10 hardest hitting earthquakes that actually delayed the, the temple planning and construction and all of that by quite a few years. Uh, and now it's a different but similar and impact uh, disaster. But uh, you know, Chilean people are strong. We send your prayers. You'll recover. And the, was it the Viña del Mar temple? Viña del Mar announced? temple. And that's uh, the area that's, precisely, that's been hit yeah. by the fires. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's a crazy connection. Yeah. My brother lives maybe like 10 blocks away from where the temple will be, kind of in downtown Viña del Mar. So that particular area was, was not affected. It was fur further away from the hills, but they were indoors with, with a curfew for days because they couldn't go out because of the smoke. Like everything was orange, you know, that orange hue that you have with these massive fires and breathing issues because of the smoke and all of that. So yeah, quite intense. Luckily, yeah. all of that is under control now. It was about five really intense days then was brought under control but well yeah. i'm so glad that it's under control and i think you know one of the benefits of a global church and of a church on the scale that we are is that we can send aid and i do yeah. i think it's great that we've got those is it helping hands the yellow vests and you yeah. can see photos literally dotted all over the earth where we're having these really difficult events but the church always seems to be there just quietly helping out and uh providing aid you know water and supplies to people and, and helping them rebuild their lives so our thoughts go out not just to the chilean saints who are affected by this but just to anyone who's affected by this and in that region truly a devastating yeah. thing that's happened definitely even as, as we're speaking i'm getting messages from my mission group we keep in touch with the missionaries from my generation many of them sending pictures for those watching on, on youtube sending pictures of uh, helping in the area. They've been there for oh, there the last couple of weeks doing it. Uh, so it's, it's the big capital C church, you know, sending aid from headquarters and whatnot, but also the little lowercase church, you know, the local church members just getting all those vests and going out. Uh, I think that's that's one of the benefits of, of being a community of saints and just helping everybody. So it, it's been inspiring to see. Um, next one, you want to share this one? The First Presidency welcomes the president of the Navajo Nation. Yes, this actually came out either yesterday or the day before. Uh, it's great to see um, that we are engaging more directly with, uh, in, in this case in the US, with Native American communities. Uh, it says here, the First Presidency of the Church uh, welcomed Navajo Nation President Dr. Bu Nigren. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, or Nigren, and his wife, First Lady, Jasmine Blackwater Nigrin uh, to Temple Square on Thursday, February 15th. So just a couple of days ago, uh, the brief gathering was held in the church administration building. There are some really nice pictures there of that encounter with President Nelson as well. And as far as I can tell, standing, not sitting. So uh, Which is great, showing that he's in better health. And the Navajo Nation, for those who um, are not clued into that, spans portions of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. Um, in southwestern United States. So in 2022, uh, the church helped them. And in 2021, they helped bring water to the area. So there's been a connection there for a couple of years. And they've invited them to 
uh, this gathering, which was held in the church administration building. So it's nice to see us reaching out to those communities again. Yeah, I think every time we help uh, and we use the position of privilege that we have as an institutional church and the resources that, that it has, it's a, it's a good thing. And, and in this case, especially reaching out to other um, ethnic groups and minority groups, in, in this case, it also helps. Uh, we know that our, our history with it is one of, of ma that has many different overtones, right? Many complexities, many highlights and lowlights. Uh, but the fact that in this day and age we're engaging uh, proactively and productively with with them, I, I, I take it as a really positive thing. And it seems to be really so well too. reciprocated. Yeah. And um, actually, just on that, on that very same day, Thursday, February the 15th. So this is just, you know, a couple of days ago. Um, on a different continent, Elder Stevenson and his wife, Lisa, um, were in Tanzania and they visited a humanitarian project that the church is helping out with. So we've got these leaders uh, ministering to people all over the globe um, at once. Yeah. So the church is helping expand the Makuburi Health Center, which serves an area of nearly 93,000 people and sits next to one of the church's chapels. So um, Elder Stevenson said this became an opportunity for us to participate in just a small way towards the wonderful things that are going on there. This municipality has a good partnership with the church uh, and it looks like they're, they're helping with sort of the healthcare, the sanitation, the water out there, which is, which is wonderful. Yeah. And I think the impact of that help in, in those communities, in any community, but especially there can be quite, quite huge, you know, the, the incremental benefit of, of what might seem as a small, uh, piece of, of, of help can go a long way. And it looks like Elder Stevenson is on a, a bit of a tour in Africa. I think he was in, in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo last week. Uh, he'll be yes, visiting. Yes, this is a nine-day tour. So yeah. over that nine days, I suppose he's visiting lots of different places. Hey, I have a question for you. Uh, yeah. And maybe I don't want to know the answer, but how do these church leaders travel? You know, are they in economy? Mm -hmm. Are they in business class? Are they on private jets? You know, what's the, that is what's a good the standard question. here? Because well, they're I, all over the place, right? Which I think can be a benefit because they're really going out and and sort of preaching the gospel in a worldwide yeah. way, which is great. But I do wonder about the carbon footprint. So this was it this week or last week there was the Super Bowl, which I'm sure mm. lots of listeners will be really, really tuned into, and I'm totally not. But I saw this <laughs> graphic of I don't know if it's correct or not, so don't quote me on it. But I saw this graphic of all the private jets leaving. The area mm. where the Super Bowl happened, and it was all the sort of rich and famous people leaving on their on their private jets on on flight radar, yeah. and it just it just got me thinking: How are our church leaders traveling around the world? So, if that anyone a knows, great, great question. Uh, please yeah, let I me saw know. that meme as well. I see he said something like, "All of these people leaving while you drink from paper straws." Paper straws, yeah. World. Yeah, I, it really hurt when I, when I saw that. But um, what I can share and take it for what it's worth, uh, but from the few sources that I have that do not go up to the level of the Quorum of the Twelve, but close, uh, yeah, it's mostly commercial commercial flights. I think, I don't know where they draw the point between business class and, and just uh, economy, but uh, I do know at least with older ones, uh, you know, they, they often do... Um, uh, business class because of the leg room and things like that and just the the comfort of it which uh, i do think about the cost of it because those things are like five six times the cost of an economy ticket oftentimes uh although the difference in carbon, carbon footprint would be you know nothing because it's the same plane but yeah but yeah private jets as far as i know um i i have no knowledge of uh the only instance that i know of is for emergency relief uh, I know that oftentimes very wealthy members of the church donate of their fleet of either jets or helicopters to respond. And But it, it's on, on that basis, not for business as usual. Uh, yeah, all the travel that I'm aware of, it's through commercial flights and, and not private jets. But again, it would be good to know, to fact check and, and to see how the church can reduce that uh, footprint, right? Um, which I guess yeah, I'm age... thinking about it from a carbon footprint perspective rather than from a financial perspective. Oh. Um, and I suppose it makes sense, you know, if you are on kind of a business trip, if it's your job, maybe you should be entitled to travel in business class. And I also think with the age that they're at, you know, maybe I, I don't have too many issues with them traveling in business class. I think if I found out they were taking private jets everywhere, I would see that as a little bit hypocritical. Yeah, troublesome, we, yeah. Yeah, that we wouldn't be taking care of this green planet that we've been given. Yeah. But 
Yeah. You know. And even I'm thinking, like, I, I think with technology now, uh, they're leveraging technology much more. So for regional conferences and things like that, even back in 2004, five, I remember in the early days of my mission, they were already implementing kind of satellite broadcasts and where the apostles would, you know, uh, do, do state conferences that way rather than them visiting. So I know that at least since then, since before the internet was fully up and running with Zoom and things like that, they were already kind of moving towards reducing that. I don't know if the intent was that, but at least there was a, an obvious reduction in travel as a result of it. Uh, I guess it was po probably more driven by the fact that it's long trips and we're talking about 80 year old people plus. But, but yeah, great point. Um, with the time that we have left, I want to move on to this non-news news, in my opinion. <laughs> Oh, this Which, is such a funny one. Yeah. I just cannot believe they managed to scrape a news article together about this. It, it was a slow news week, even though it doesn't seem like that because we talk a lot. Uh, it was a slow <laughs> news week, people. So the news is a new group photo of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles is now available. Come and there's on, a whole article about news. it. This is not news. They've taken a picture. <laughs> they did. That's all they've yeah. done. They've taken a new picture. Well, probably the only newsworthy aspect of it is that Elder Kieran is there for the first time in an official Quorum of the Twelve picture. And it's always good to have those. I, I do, and this is the, the cynic in me kind of kicking in, uh, but I do want to, by, by making a big deal about this picture, because this is going to come out in, in the next um, Liahona, most likely, or it's going to be populated in church websites and kind of the official pages. But by making it a news article, uh, aren't we like, dangerously kind of stepping into the this realm of hero worship and kind of creating a bigger deal of the humans associated to these divine callings than, than we should. And especially since we had a fantastic talk about avoiding hero worship in the last conference or, or two ago um, by Elder Waddell, if I remember correctly. I, I do wonder, I can't help but see that and be like, nice picture, but why, why are we doing this? Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh. I have a couple of stories on this, actually. So when I'd been a member of the church for about a year or so, I was living, I went to live in Australia, and or maybe I've been a member two years. Anyway, and <laughs> I decided that I was going to go and deliver brownies to some of the ward council. So I, I wasn't in ward council. I just <laughs> thought, oh, you know, I'll thank my leaders for being my oh. leaders and I'll go and deliver them brownies. Yeah. And I went you. to someone's house who I would never usually go to, which is why this story becomes important in a moment. And when he opened the door, I saw that he had a picture of President Monson like hanging up in his mm. house. And my first thought was like, that's such a formal picture of someone's grandfather, you know, just looking at it, yeah. like, why have they got that incredibly formal picture? And then I realized, oh, no, that's President Monson that they've got hanging up. And I just remember thinking that is so strange. Like, why, why do we do that? And then another quick story is that in our chapel building at the moment, we have got um, in our nursery room, I don't know why, but somebody has put a picture up on the cupboard, which has all the toys in it, of the first presidency with President Nelson in it. And I may have mentioned previously that I'm a mum of twins and that we have a twins club that is run in our chapel that's used by people not of our yes. faith. Yeah. And we borrow the nursery toys. And every time I direct them to go down to the nursery cupboard and, and open that cupboard, I think, oh, they're going to see this picture of our of our first presidency. And they're going to think, why have they got that? And, you know, they're going to think, who are those people? So, yeah, I, I find it a little <laughs> bit strange. But, you know, yeah. there are worse things happening in the world. I don't, it's not a deal breaker. I just, it, it's one of those things that I don't really get. And I think it, it's just yeah. a bit odd. It's one of those peculiarities. We are a peculiar people. That, that that's a phrase we, yeah. we 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 hold dear. But and yeah, that that is a peculiarity. I think I was completely oblivious to the oddness or, or the you know the how peculiar it, it is uh, because again, I grew up in the church. So I grew up seeing the Quorum of the Twelve in the primary room back when the Quorum of the Twelve had like Elder Iring as the youngest one, <laughs> right? And, you know, or even before that, I remember seeing President Benson and his counselors, uh, Gordon B. Hinckley and Thomas S. Munson, <laughs> uh, there. Um, to me, it was second nature. It's like, yeah, the prophet, and the, you know, they're there and it's fine. Even to this day, in our, in our uh, bishopric room, we do have, of course, a picture of the Savior, uh, first and foremost. But we also have a... a, a um, what do you call it? like a, a framed picture of the first presidency 
which I think is a nice room. It's more of a leadership kind of uh, room, right? Um, but but still, sometimes I'm like, we could do without it, right? Like, there's, I don't know. I, I sympathize with with what you're sharing, and but anyway, it's one of those things that I would not die on that hill, right? Or I wouldn't Agreed. fight that battle. Agreed, yeah. totally. It's a peculiarity. Um, and probably worth saying that they look great in the picture. Looking at yeah, them. Yeah, they all look uh, healthy and strong, so that's good. Yeah, that's good. But one of them, Elder Ugdorf, I, I don't know how he does it. He's like 83 years old before, and he looks the same that he did like when he was called. A little more kind of white hair, but um, an Elder Bednar uh, also looking a bit older, but he was called so young that, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Uh, it's great to see Elder Holland there as well, still. And, well, Elder Kieran. However, um, this is a not news news. We had to say it. Um, here it is. <laughs> Should we finish with uh, with the, with Mormons behaving not badly? We're going to pivot a little bit from our fellow <laughs> From hosts. the normal <laughs> segment of Mormons behaving badly. Yeah, there is a story. And, I mean, it, it starts out as a, pretty tragic story to be honest um which is that you you may have heard of this this gentleman um on may the 29th 2021 u.s navy lieutenant um ridge alkanis took his family to hike a portion of mount fuji while they were stationed in japan and um on his way home he lost consciousness he uh, lost control of the car it resulted in the deaths of two japanese citizens it was a really tragic Oof. story at the time yeah. um and he ended up being convicted of uh, a crime essentially yeah, um, reckless driving oh yeah something like that yeah reckless driving or something like that anyway he ended up um for 537 days um being held in custody and uh, eventually on friday the 12th of january him and his family were reunited and he recently was a guest on the all in podcast and he spoke about the experience and he basically said that he used his testimony of the gospel to get him through that time when he'd been wrongly convicted which is why when I thought about us covering this story I thought oh well Mormon's behaving badly he was not behaving badly he was behaving not badly so Mormon's yeah. behaving not badly is the story that we're covering this week that's really nice I, I think that it's good to hear those those it's a very peculiar story right it's a, I think he served a mission in Japan and that's why he was visiting with family some of the the, the places where he had been stationed as well as part of the military so uh, and then this happened and from what I remember the the disagreement I, I guess the the Japanese um, um, uh, what is it called that legal process led to their conclusion that he was re reckless driving but the parallel investigation was that he had just had a stroke or something like that or or some some sort of um it said uh, altitude sickness uh, exactly yeah altitude sickness so it, it was not intentional therefore the charges were not valid and eventually that that came through but but yeah really really difficult and i'm glad to see somebody that we might have ascribed some degree of responsibility and in the category of behaving badly, getting out of it and finding redemption, and not just redemption, but support in in in, in his faith, and, and I think that's great. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, he was in a pretty desperate situation. If I was put in prison, I think I'd probably just give up. You know, if I knew that I didn't commit a crime, and then I was placed into custody for you know a really really long time, like almost two years, was it? Um, yeah. And I would probably just give up, but he read lots and lots of books. It says he read 192 books in prison, including studying the scriptures. And he found strength and inspiration from people in scripture who went through difficult times, despite their righteousness. And I think that's a nice way to wrap things up, because ultimately, we are a, a, a safe space to talk about all things LDS and LDS adjacent. Uh, but, but we do want to promote faith. Like both George and I, we, we, we do have a, a sincere what can i say like allegiance sincere testimony you know a, a conviction of, the, of of these things and the good that the, both the gospel and also the, the church you know local church and general church can bring to the world we're quite aware as well that we're far from perfect and and we're quite open about those things and 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 try to articulate them and vocalize them in a way that hopefully listeners feel comfortable with or or or, or can help them become more comfortable discussing some of these topics because historically we have done a really poor job of that. So I hope that helps, and and I love love that we're finishing with a with a story of redemption or a story where actually our beliefs were what uh, 
what helped this this man and, and, and their family, his family. So thank you, Georgia, for, for sharing that one. Yeah, no problem. And as we wrap up this week, we just uh, encourage you to contact us with any feedback that you've got. Contact us this week in mormons.com and subscribe on social media. And we hope to see you again. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Georgia. Thanks, okay, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.